Okay, let's talk some Byzantine art and architecture. We're going to discuss some, some major works and really try to understand the style and major themes that are associated with Byzantine art and architecture and also their cultural significance. Byzantine art has two themes. It's either religious or imperial. Most of the time, however, these two are often mixed. This reflects the uh, state of the government in the Byzantine Empire. You had the emperor who was technically the head of the Byzantine um, Greek Orthodox Church who appoints the Patriarch of Constantinople who administers this church for him. In Byzantine art, we typically see the use of icons, and you're going to see several in this presentation. These are representations of religious figures, but they could also be representations of government officials, as we're going to see with both Justinian and Theodora, his wife. Later on, we are going to see the iconoclasts, the iconoclasm. It is a movement to rid the Byzantine world of these icons. There had been members, particularly in the East, where the worship of any sort of icon was considered idolatry um, against the teachings of uh, the Old Testament. So, <clears throat> so there was that fear, and we're going to see later on this, and we'll talk about it more in detail when we talk about the split between the uh, Western Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church in the East, but we're going to see a program of actually destroying a lot of these icons. Much of the debate arises over depicting Jesus in his human form. In both the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox Church's versions of the divinity of Jesus, Jesus had always existed because Jesus is God. Uh, this is unlike the um, version of Aryan Christianity that we saw amongst many of the Germanic tribes in the West, where they believed that Jesus, God, had come first and later Jesus was created. So the depiction of an all-powerful, omnipotent being in human form, many consider that sacrilegious. So as a result, a lot of Byzantine art gets destroyed. But before that, in some of these surviving works, iconography was extremely important in both the East and the West. And there's some certain styles that we have to see here that we have to take a look at to make sure that we can identify it as being characteristic of this time period and also of the Byzantine Empire. Now there are three types you know, we're not talking about religious and imperial, we're talking down here, illuminated manuscripts. Yes, Constantinople was the center of trade, but remember, this empire, especially under Justinian, is going to encompass a wide variety of peoples, a wide variety of languages, a, wi a wide variety of writing styles, even though Greek was prominent in the East. Also, literacy rates were still very low during this time period. I mean, literacy rates do not come into, you know, being very high until very, very recent in human history. So having an illuminated manuscript being able to tell a story is going to be necessary and important because most people can't you know, read the text that it's written in. You also have mosaics. These are small little pieces of treated glass, typically glass, uh, sometimes stone, but most of the time it's glass, uh, that were pieced together and then painted on to reveal these these very long-standing mosaics. And then you also have carved reliefs. Uh, they were typically out of ivory, but they could also be out of other materials as well, uh, whether they were marble or what have you. And you're going to see all three here in this presentation. It's important when you see these images as we move on here, as you see each slide, really try to note three things. Number one, uh, what is it? Is it an illuminated manuscript example? Is it a mosaic example? Or is it some sort of relief? Number two, what is it depicting? Um, what do you see? What's going on here? And number three, <clears throat> how does it depict these themes up here? Either religious, imperial, or as you're going to see, how they're mixed. Okay? So focus on those three things for me. What is it? What's it depicting? And what is it, in essence, what is it saying? So let's take a look. These are two examples 
of illuminated manuscripts. On the left, this is definitely religious, and it is on the right as well. This is uh, depicting Jesus' crucifixion, along with the two other people that were crucified. Uh, and it depicts the final death, the stabbing into the side. Uh, notice the halo around Jesus' head. Uh, as you often see, you have angels on each side over on one on the right. This is his mother, the Virgin Mary. You have angels as he... This is after the risen of Jesus as he ascends into heaven. These illuminated manuscripts, they're religious obviously, but they're very easy to interpret. Uh, a lay person, just a normal run-of-the-mill person, can go ahead, take a look at this, and say, oh, this is what's going on. Okay, and that's very important with these illuminated manuscripts. It's not like abstract art where it looks like it's something that my four-year-old made when he just decided to start throwing paint at a wall. Uh, it's easy to tell. Okay, remember, the purpose of these illuminated manuscripts is to tell a story, almost like a comic strip would, without having those captions. And these two do this very well. Next up, we have a relief. Uh, this depicts the consul of Constantinople. If you think back to Rome, remember, Byzantines see themselves as Romans. They're just in a different location. Uh, consuls were typically in charge of the military. Later on, they became almost advisors of the emperor. And here you have the consul seated on the throne. Uh, you got his cronies behind him here. And below him, if you can see the action, what's going on is it's some sort of gladiatorial coliseum-like structure where people are looking on. Uh, here we are, we have um, a group of men fighting different animals. Uh, oftentimes this is what would happen. They would bring in a whole bunch of different wild animals from all corners of the globe. Remember, Constantinople, it's a trade destination, uh, to entertain the masses. So once again, we see a, a continuation of this Roman culture. Uh, not a whole lot religious with this one. I mean, you do have sort of the scepter here, but that was just commonplace of all consuls. You know, it really doesn't denote Christianity at all. Uh, so this is largely an imperial uh, relief. From an artistic point of view, uh, it has some of the characteristic traits of Byzantines. Uh, they're known to have really rounded faces. It's just the, the style that they they try to employ. Typically, when you when you put a little bit of rounding to whether it's an animal or a face or any sort of living object that was to try. It's an early attempt at realism. Uh, these pretty much fail, uh, but still it's an attempt uh, by artists to go ahead and show realism in their paintings because very often you don't see straight lines. Typically the only time that you see straight lines is if it's a man-made structure. If it's a person or uh, natural physical geography or if it's an animal, you're going to see rounded structures. Uh, next up, let's take a look at a couple of examples of mosaics here. Here we have a close-up of the mosaic of Theodora, Justinian's co-empress. Notice the halo behind her, the well-adorned crown. She is once again facing forward. Uh, much more slender face, but still you see curves, you see rounding of the face, particularly in the eyes as well. Here you have probably the most famous image uh, from Byzantine mosaics. This is Justinian and his court. Very important um, artifact. Once again, you have rounded faces. Once again, you have some attempts at some perspective and depth. However, this one looks kind of flat. Once again, these are early attempts. And what this depicts is if you look on the left, you've got the priests, okay, holding a Bible, incense, the cross over here. You have Justinian in the middle, obviously, with the crown. And over here on the far right, you have. you have his military. Notice the bowl he's carrying as well. Um, ultimately to show that, hey, I'm in charge of the priests, I'm in charge of the religion, after all he's got a halo um, behind him as well, I'm in charge of the military, and I'm basically in charge of the of Constantinople and this entire empire. Whether you're talking about economics, military, or religion, it's Justinian. It's the emperor. 
Here we have another relief. This one is strictly religious. Uh, you wouldn't know this if I didn't tell you, but hey, that's why we're here. This is Saint Michael, uh, who expels Satan from paradise. But what you're going to see, and what's really important about these Byzantine works that we're taking a look at, particularly with icons, is that icons become, and this is so important, guys, icons become easily recognizable figures. Uh, whether we're talking about the Archangel Michael, whether we're talking about the Virgin Mary, whether we're talking about Jesus. The way that they are depicted, the style that they are depicted, the certain features that they have uh, that are still, in many respects, even recognizable within the Christian faith today, they really come about during the Byzantine Empire. So here you have a strictly religious image of Michael the Archangel hanging out with the scepter and everything. And here you have Justinian. Once again, rounded faces, uh, but if you look above, you have this recognizable face of Saint Michael the Archangel. Now what this is, is Justinian on his horse, um, you know, with, with, you know, angels on each side, and this depicts him conquering the barbarians of the West. Okay? Now, what this says is, here we have St. Michael who's looking down above him, and he's basically saying that what Justinian is doing is not just a good idea economically, even though it wasn't. It's not just a good idea because, hey, let's grab some territory. It was a good idea because it had a religious purpose behind it. This is one of those perfect marriages between what is imperial right here and what is religious to make this mix between the two, because oftentimes it's very difficult to separate the two. This example is from Ravenna, Italy. It um, is during the time of Justinian's reign. It depicts Jesus in the middle. Uh, notice here, there's not a whole lot of detail in these mosaics. Oftentimes what they would do is they would sacrifice um, realistic detail in favor of these spiritual images, okay, where you got the, you know, they're holding the church here, we've got the halos, the wings behind them, and these sorts of things. This was common amongst most Byzantine mosaics. Here we have an early attempt at some three dimensions. Uh, you can see it's just, it's not perfect, okay. Uh, later on when we start to see them actually employing geometry uh, during the Renaissance, it'll get much better. But once again, this is religious, this is iconography, this is the Virgin Mary holding uh, Jesus, but once again, uh, this is not very realistic, okay, just the ratios are off, okay, the head's too small for these bodies, but once again, uh, these were sacrifices made in order to depict these religious uh, figures. And still, they're still easily recognizable. We typically see Jesus as a small boy sitting in Mary's lap in one, in one way or another, and oftentimes the Virgin Mary is depicted wearing some form of blue as well. So that's just sort of a good introduction. We're going to focus on architecture in class uh, once you get here. Some things to think about for next class, be able to discuss with me as soon as you walk in the door. Think about the different types of Byzantine artwork and their functions uh, that we saw today. Uh, think about this one. Importance and reasons for the types of artwork we commonly see in Byzantium. Why would they make these things? You know, like that image of Justinian with Michael looking over him. Why make it? What is the purpose of that? How does that help him? Um, so think about that. How was it influenced and how it later influenced, which we're going to be focusing on in class. Okay? Thanks for listening. See you next time.